Hello! Today, I'm going to show you how I go from a proper 1770s silhouette to a relaxed 1790s shape using the same pattern. Why? A few months ago, my friend Noelle from Costuming Drama made this perfect 1990s grunge hoodie dress, and since I was planning on doing a 90s inspired birthday party, I joked I needed a pink birthday cake version. And then I decided I did actually need one. Luckily, I was able to get the fabric. Thanks, Hannah. Like a lot of things in the last two years, the party ended up being cancelled, but in an effort to cheer myself up, I decided to make the dress regardless. Anyway, let's start with the basic structure. I'm using the front bodice piece of my pattern without the center front point. I've just vaguely folded it up out of the way, but I'd suggest a slightly less chaotic approach if you don't do this all the time. Making a gown like this is really simple if you've already got an 18th century dress pattern that fits you well. Any of the commercially available patterns will do, and I'll link them down below. Luckily for me though, my buddy Amber from Virgil's Fine Goods draped a new one for me last summer. Check out my brand new birthday scissors. For my lining and understructure, I'm using a super sturdy lavender linen. Since I know this pattern fits me really well, I'm not doing a mock-up, but if this is your first time making one of these, I suggest doing one. One of my absolute favorite styles of dress is the fitted back chemise gown, also known as a chemise à la reine, or sometimes just a gathered front round gown, which is in itself a variation on the chemise à la reine. But whatever, in this case, it's a chemise à la birthday, or a chemise à la grunge. Chemise à la Barbie? You decide. I basted everything together to check fit, and no changes were really needed. With everything snug around the torso, I just had to fit the shoulder straps, which is best done on the body. This is accomplished by pinching the seam allowances together and pinning the raw edges outward. This gets hidden later by the shoulder strap in the fashion fabric. It's important that this area is snug so that your sleeves don't go sliding down later. With the straps tightly fitted, I trimmed off the excess to reduce bulk and then got started with ironing the fashion fabric. The fabric crinkled up a lot in the dryer and is a huge pain to iron because it's made of air, apparently. I got there in the end, but not without a lot of complaining. With the fabric finally flattened into submission, I was able to cut out the shoulder straps as well as the front bodice fashion fabric layer. To attach the fashion fabric to the lining, you basically fold under the seam allowance, except for where the sleeves and back panel attach, and then press it and pin or baste it. After that, you just slip stitch the pieces together. I forgot to film that bit, but I feel like you've seen me slip stitch stuff before and you're going to see me do it later. I left about half of the waist edge, closest to the back panel, unstitched because I'm going to slip the skirt in there later. Pins will do for now. I repeated the process for the other bodice front, giving myself a fully half finished bodice front. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Anyway, and then after this was done, it was time to move on to the back. If I was a good YouTuber, I would have filmed this properly. Instead, you get an artist's rendition. Except, if you were looking for some Bernadette-level aesthetic illustration, you were in the wrong place. Anyway, for a pleated back gown, a fitted back is a whole other video, you need your back panel to be the full width of your fabric and long enough to go from the back neckline to the floor. If you want a train, make it longer. It should be about this big-ish. <laughs> Make sure you're wearing your petticoats and any silhouette enhancers while determining the length, by the way. This whole panel gets pleated down to the back lining and will create both the back of your bodice and the back of the skirt. Before I started pleating, I first had to pin the center of the large back panel to the center of the back bodice lining. I should have basted this instead, but oh well. On the one hand, pleating this was a nightmare as far as getting things straight, but super easy because of the stripes. It ended up taking me exactly 14 minutes to pleat it into a simple fan shape. If this is your first time, I highly suggest using a stripe or a check fabric to make it easier on yourself. Having the pattern of the fabric as a guide can be really helpful. Also, there's no right way to do it. It all depends on what looks good to your eye.
Okay, but how do you go from a pleated panel to a fitted back? Well, stick figure to the rescue again. I might have to do a more detailed tutorial on this very stressful area later, but for now, basically, once the back is pleated, you trim away the excess around the bodice, leaving the full width of the panel from the waistline down in place for pleating the skirt. I realize now that this looks like underarm hair. Pretend it's not. Anyway, after this scary cut, this extra width here gets pulled toward the center back via some slightly wonky pleating. It looks really cool in the end, but it's a stressful 20 minutes. It's kind of hard to see on this fabric, so I'll put a link in the description of a yellow silk gown from the VNA where you can see what I've done a lot more clearly. After the back panel was sorted out, it was time for me to add the front panels, which are attached at the side back, which, you know, whatever, it makes sense. Because I normally hand sew gowns though, I got a little confused with the order of operations for the side seam. Listen, 18th century mancho makers knew what they were doing, and this isn't it. But oh well, this does the trick. I stitched the lining together first, and then we'll be smoothing the fashion fabric over it later. Before I could fully attach the front panel, I needed to add the rest of the skirt on both sides. I did this by pattern matching the fabric at the bottom hem, then working my way up to the waistline. Pretty easy. Pleating this mess less easy. Just like with the back panel, having lines to work with makes the pleating a little bit simpler, but these aren't really evenly spaced lines, and I needed to fudge it quite a bit to make all this fabric, about 90 inches on each side, fit into a very small space between the back panel and side front. The good news is, pleats weren't mathematical in the 18th century, and making it up as you go is completely accurate. After the panels were pleated, I basted the pleats to hold the shape, and then sandwiched the pleats between the lining and the fashion fabric of the bodice. I basted over all three layers in red thread, which you can probably see here a bit, and then started the process of slip stitching the lining to the pleats. With the lining attached to the skirts, I could finally finish the bodice. I smoothed the back panel's fashion layer back over the lining and loosely basted it into place. I wish I had done this basting earlier, but thankfully the piece didn't stretch out too badly. After the side was basted, I folded under the remaining bottom edge and slip stitched that to the skirt. With everything stitched down and smooth, I carefully layered the remaining back edge of the bodice over the side seam and folded under the raw edge. This took a bit of fiddling because I had neglected to leave myself extra seam allowance to create an aesthetically pleasing curved seam. When I felt like it looked okay, I secured the seam with a tiny spaced back stitch. It ended up looking a little wobbly, but workable. All I had left to finish the main bodice of the gown was to slip stitch the fashion fabric over the pleats. I find this extremely satisfying to do and it's one of my favorite parts of dressmaking, like, as a whole. And now we're done, right? No. We still need sleeves and we haven't even made it a chemise gown yet. I did not want lined sleeves as this is supposed to be light and airy, so I just cut two of my sleeve pattern, made sure I had a right and a left, and serged the seam. Really simple. Setting sleeves, less simple. It can be a huge pain, but here's how I do it. First, I tried on my gown and the sleeves before they were attached and pinned the point where the sleeve hits the front shoulder strap. I then took everything off and pinned the underarm portion of the sleeve using my dress form shoulder. After that, I smoothed the rest of the sleeve cap onto the shoulder strap's lining, pleating it at the back until it sits nice and flat. We don't do puffed sleeves in the 1780s, you just need enough extra fabric to be able to move. This doesn't always work on the first try, but thankfully, my sleeve pattern is pretty good. At this point, I could just stitch on the sleeves, pop on the shoulder straps, and be done, but no. We want a filthy grunge cupcake. Wait, that's gross. Anyway, 
To add a gathered panel to the front, you just take another full width of your fabric, just like we did on the back, but this time it should be long enough to reach from the top shoulder strap, plus about an inch seam allowance, to the bottom hem. This panel needs to be sewn on both sides from the bottom hem upward to about 8 to 10 inches from the waistline. This will become the opening for the pocket. If you want more of a scoop neckline, you will need to take out a tiny bit of length from the center front, but I'm going for a squarish neckline here. With the sides of the front panel stitched to the sides of the skirt, I folded over the seam allowance at the top edge in order to create a drawstring casing. I pulled through a tape, having the ends exit at the center front on the inside, and honestly, I didn't even put an eyelet here. It's fine. I took a few moments to quickly hem the skirt and the sleeves. I know I've done a lot of hand sewing on this gown, but only on places where it's really necessary. With the lavender cotton thread that I'm using, you can't even see the machine stitches in the hem, so doing it by hand wouldn't have even improved anything. Back to the gathered bodice front. The sides of the front panel were left raw until the drawstring was through, but they still needed to be tucked under and stitched. Sometimes I stitch the sides of the front panel down to the under bodice, but I find that everything actually sits more smoothly if that's left free. I went ahead and finished off the entire side opening though, down through the pocket, and then moved on to secure the front panel to the shoulder strap area. After the bodice was fully assembled, all that was really left was attaching the sleeves and a few finishing touches. I usually put the sleeves in by hand, even when I don't have to, because it ends up being faster than trying to shove it all under the machine in a tiny space, and it just is a mess. By hand, faster, and neater. To cover the top back edge of the bodice, I bound the area with a strip of cotton. The ends will be hidden under the shoulder straps. Putting on shoulder straps is super satisfying because it's such a small step that takes you from a wonky mess to a clean, finished garment. I accomplished this by starting at the neckline and smoothing outward, folding under and pinning the strap fabric as I go. This little corner area at the back is a little bit fiddly, but I'm so happy with how it came out. When it's nice and smooth, I stitch it down with a combination of space back stitches and slip stitches. Originally, I was going to wear a black taffeta sash with this, but then this purple silk, which was destined to be a sash for another project anyway, caught my eye. This fabric is about 59 inches wide, and all I did to make the sash was cut three 8 inch pieces off the end, and then stitch them together end to end, making a super super long sash that can be doubled around my waist. Hmm, silk guts. I decided to be supremely extra and fringe the ends, but I'm so, so glad I did. She is finished. Here you can see kind of the weird opening at the front where it's attached, but it's not attached. This is the pocket slit I was talking about before. And so all of this gathered panel is really just secured at the very, very top. You can see the uh, drawstring here on the inside uh, with the under bodice, but Basically, it's just attached at the top front two corners, and it is attached, like it is sewn within an inch of its life, essentially woven into the fabric because I did not want this to fall off at any inopportune moments, but I did want freedom of movement. I don't usually take the time to insert my skirts between the lining and the outside, just usually choosing to fold it over and let it hang free, but this frays so badly it was kind of necessary. I really like how you can see the stitching from the outside on the interior because that's something that is seen in historical dresses and um yeah I'm just yeah I'm pretty much in love with it oh hello basting stitches I guess I could take those out now right I could not be happier with how this came out, and as depressed as I am to have my party cancelled and not be able to see my friends, I know it was the right thing to do and definitely recommend putting on a crazy dress and having a giant cupcake in your backyard if you ever feel even the slightest inclination of sadness. It really helps. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you liked it, if you did, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you feel like it, and I'll see you again soon, bye!